Welcome to Short Circuit, your podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeals. I'm your host, Anthony Sanders, Director of the Center for Judicial Engagement at the Institute for Justice. We're recording this on Tuesday, January 30th, 2024, and I am so extremely excited by the two special guests that we have on today. It's going to be a pairing I think you all will love, and we'll get to it in just a moment. Uh, First of all, an announcement that we've made a couple times in recent months. We are hiring here at the Institute for Justice, including an attorney position at the Center for Judicial Engagement. So if you like researching judicial engagement and liberty and justice and all that stuff, and maybe you'd like to do something one day like, I don't know, host an episode of Short Circuit, then you should apply to us. You can find us on our job p- jobs page. We will put a link in the show notes for that. And IJ is also hiring more generally for litigation positions. So please check us out if you are interested in a career change. Now, we have two guests that I'm going to give you their names right up front and then tell you why they're here. One needs no introduction. He is David Latt. He has been on the show before, and we're very happy to have him on again. The other is in a just universe, this man would also need no introduction, and that is Dan Sullivan. And I will tell you why you should know all about Dan Sullivan in just a moment. So the genesis of this episode is a couple months ago, I was traveling. I was tired. I was in an airport. I was waiting for my flight. I checked my phone, look at my email. And immediately, my frown got turned upside down because I saw there was an email for one of my favorite newsletters, Original Jurisdiction. And that, of course, is the newsletter that David Latt produces. Now, um, it wasn't the every Sunday main Original Jurisdiction. It was a special bonus you get as a subscriber to Original Jurisdiction, which is Latt's Legal Library. And in Latt's legal library, where um, David gives some blurbs of a, a few recent books, he included my book. And that was, I was just tickled pink. I was so excited to be in there. So I was all excited. And, uh, and then I look at my next email. My next email is from Dan Sullivan. Now, Dan Sullivan, I should now fill in, is a very successful litigator in New York City. He is a partner at Holwell, Schuster, and Goldberg. He also, a few years ago, clerked for a certain Justice Scalia. Um, But a few years before that, he was an intern rat in Washington, D.C. Now, I was also an intern rat in Washington, D.C., and we were kind of part of the same program. And we lived in um, this housing complex. And one day, I was walking to Safeway to get some groceries, uh, as we all had the little self-catering units. And... um, I passed Dan. He was like just sitting on the curb. And Dan, I, I'm sure you have absolutely no memory of this. And uh, he's like, why are you going to Safeway? You should go to Giant. And I was like, Giant? He's like, yeah, there's like this special passage through the woods. And then you would, there's like a Giant on the other side that I didn't even know about. So, oh, okay. So I went to Giant, which is, and Giant's fine. Um, but they had a really good cheap wine selection. So I got some of that, which all of us interns at the time, you know, that was a, a thing we, we liked purchasing. So I got some cheap wine. Then a few years later, Dan is attending the University of Chicago Law School. And my wife is attending the same school. And so uh, we hung out and he introduced me to Harold's Chicken Shack. Now, if you like good cheap chicken and you live in the Chicago area, you should go to Harold's Chicken Shack. If you instead went to uh, KFC, you made the wrong choice. Go to Harold's Chicken Shack. So because of Dan, I uh, I am thankful for cheap wine and cheap chicken which I I'm, I'm, uh, will always be thankful for. Going back to, da- uh, to David, not only does he have an original jurisdiction, he has his own podcast. We'll tell you all about the, the movers and shakers in the legal world. It is movers, shakers, and rainmakers. And all of you know, he also is the founder of Above the Law. And way back in the day was our favorite anonymous blogger, Article 3 Groupie. So, Why do I have these two random characters on my show? It's because they both clerked for the same judge, Dan before the days of Justice Scalia, and that's Judge O'Scanlan on the Ninth Circuit. Now, Judge O'Scanlan is a senior judge these days, uh, but for many years he was, uh, I think it's fair to say, the great dissenter on the Ninth Circuit. The Ninth Circuit's changed a little bit, but maybe not that much. 
And so we're going to get a case from the Ninth Circuit that involves Judge O'Scanlan a little bit. We'll also have a case from the Eleventh Circuit that I, I guess has a Judge O'Scanlan twist on it. Um, but before we do any of that, I have been talking way too long. So I want to thank my friends, David Lapp back on the show and Dan on for the first time and uh, hear a little bit about their uh, their bond, which is clerking for Judge O'Scanlan. So welcome, gentlemen. Hey, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, Anthony. Okay, so what was it like clerking for Judge O'Scanlan? What's it like going to live in Portland for a year? This was back in the day when Portland really was Portlandia, I believe, for, for both of you. I think that might have been more your time, Dan. You're a little uh, younger than I am. When I was there, it was pre-Portlandia, and so it was not as hip and cool as it is today, although they've had some recent troubles there as well. But uh, anyway, was Portlandia during your time there? Yeah. In fact, uh, the show, I think, the first season came out while I was clerking there, so or maybe it was the year later, but it was it was very much the land of Portlandia and uh, a lot of episodes of the show, you know, rang true to our own experiences. And and more importantly, what's it like clerking for a Judge O'Scanlan? And, and also that the courthouse he is in um, is a, it's like an ancient, beautiful courthouse there in, in, in Portland. Am I right? Yes. The Pioneer Courthouse. I believe it is the oldest federal courthouse west of the Mississippi. And clerking for Judge O'Scanlan is wonderful. He's not only a great judge, but he's also a great boss. And that is not always true, unfortunately. Uh, there, in fact, is now an organization, the Legal Accountability Project, focused on people uh, who are not in good clerkships. But clerking for Judge O'Scanlan was wonderful. He is a great mentor of mine to this day. And my co-clerks were and are some of my dearest friends. So it was really one of the best years in my life, to be honest. Yeah, I would second that. Um, he was, um, you know, as David said, a wonderful boss and a wonderful judge. And, and the experience was, you know, it was a bit like uh, kind of being a country lawyer. You know, we were, you know, for, 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 for one thing, we were, you know, oftentimes the only only uh, workers, it seemed, in downtown Portland in suits. But, you know, I would take the the um, uh, the light rail, you know, uh, 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 five or ten minutes and then walk to beautiful courthouse there, which is exceptionally well maintained. And Judge O'Scanlan has been a part of, uh, you know, renovating and maintaining the courthouse over the years. And it's, it's, uh, you know, kind of a jewel in downtown Portland. Um, and he's just a prince of a guy. And, and, um, you know, I think we all learned a great deal and sort of, you know, could not have asked for a better launching pad for our legal careers. And is there something special? So he was one of, at the time, we, both of you were there, right? Very few cons more conservative judges on the Ninth Circuit. Now there's a there's a few more with the the Trump appointments, um, and and so he was well known for a while, being the one to kind of call out as a dissent or a dissental, as sometimes is said that the Supreme Court should should look into this issue. Was there a certain, uh, I guess, kind of subcomponent of the job that was focused in that? Or is it just kind of it, it would come up as the cases come up and, uh, and, and maybe it doesn't affect the work of the clerk that much? No, it was. I mean, it was a part of our, our job to sort of, um, you know, monitor is probably not the right word, but be keep apprised of the decisions of the court as a whole as they came out. Of course, you had your own workload, the workload that the judge had on the panels that he sat on. But part of what we did was to, as I say, uh, to keep abreast of new decisions as they were arising. And, you know, there might be a petition for rehearing uh, in bank in those cases. There might not, of course. Um, but that was sort of a part of our regular activity. And I think, uh, and this will come up a little bit later, um, talk about the case that I'm going to talk about. It, it was part of uh, how Judge O'Scanlan saw his role in the court and his job was to, to um, you know, flag issues that where there were circuit splits or where there was an inconsistency in Ninth Circuit precedent um, so that uh, if it was appropriate and it was necessary, the Supreme Court could be made aware of, of the case and weigh in. And that would happen with, you know, frequency that he would, he would, um, uh, want a case to be reheard in bank and then would dissent from the denial of that rehearing if, if, it, if the vote didn't go his way. And then that 
dissent from denial might become the basis for a Supreme Court decision at the end of the, the day. And David, that was your experience at, at the time you were there too? Absolutely. I would probably say that a quarter to a third of my work, at least, involved monitoring cases uh, that uh, and opinions. Each opinion that was issued, we would get the little white hard copy slip opinion. It would be funneled to one of the four clerks, and the clerk would have to read it and see whether or not it was something of interest that might be worth attempting to call for rehearing on Bonk. As Dan mentioned, the court was a little different then. It was significantly to the left of even its current incarnation. And so it could be sort of an uphill battle to actually get the case reheard. But if the case was not reheard, then you could issue the dissent from denial of rehearing on Bonk, aka dissental. And Judge O'Scanlan was really a master at that. And he still does it. Technically, because he's a senior judge, he can't vote. So these are not dissents from denial of rehearing, but they are statements regarding denial of rehearing. So I think we all still think of them as dissentals. They, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, but technically that's why you'll see on an opinion that it's a statement, not a dissent. Is there a word that's been made up to say a dissental by a senior judge? Because I have to say, I'm not a huge fan of, of dissental. Although I, I understand it's used. We make fun of it some t weeks in the newsletter in Short Circuit. But um, it, you haven't heard of a, a new word in that regard? I have to say, I did not like it initially, but I have learned to actually like it because it's very functional. And to me, language at the end of the day is about function. And dissent from denial of rehearing on Bonk is quite a mouthful. That's true. That's true. And the economy of words that we have, there, there, there's something to that. Also, I should, before we turn to the case, I should uh, give a shout out. You mentioned the Legal Accountability Project that's led by uh, uh, Eliza uh, Schatzman. And we had her on a couple of years ago when she was just starting the project with some really good work for judges who maybe aren't the best bosses and resources that, um, that clerks for those judges can use. So if you're interested in that issue, a search legal accountability project, you'll be able to find it. So now uh, we're going to way away from Portland to the 11th Circuit. And um, we, David, you have a case uh, to tell us about that involves one of our favorite things here on the podcast, which is a Judge Newsom concurrence. Um, but it also involves someone who has been in the news very much lately, although perhaps not so much in the future, and that's Ron DeSantis. Yes, exactly. So I'm going to be discussing the case of Warren v. DeSantis, and this was a case that was in the news quite a bit. It involved Andrew Warren, who was an elected state prosecutor. He was the state attorney for Florida's 13th Judicial District, so that's around Tampa, I believe. He's a Democrat. He campaigned as a progressive prosecutor. He was elected to a second term in 2020. But in 2022, he was suspended by Governor Ron DeSantis, who is a Republican and quite conservative. And essentially, uh, there was a dispute over the correctness or legality of uh, Warren's suspension. Um, and he sued under Section 1983, alleging that his First Amendment rights were violated. So let me give a little bit of background that's relevant to the case. He had a couple of policies that became an issue in the case, Warren, the prosecutor. He had a what was called the discretion policy, which essentially says that prosecutors need to exercise discretion in the cases they bring. Uh, I think the progressive slant on it probably means mm, don't be too quick to pull the trigger on not very serious cases. The second was actually more explicit in that direction. It was called the low-level offense policy, and it was a list of offenses or charges that the uh, office would pres presumptively not bring or prosecute, types of crimes that they would not prosecute. And third was called the bike policy, and this was a non-prosecution presumption in cases resulting from non-criminal bike and pedestrian violations. And very importantly to this opinion, he adopted all these policies through a specific process. So when Andrew Warren wanted to make something off his policy, he would consult his executive committee. They would draft and revise the policy. It would sometimes get outside input. It would be finalized. Managers would be briefed on it. Uh, line lawyers would be trained in it. And it would put, be put in this guidebook of official policies and would be put on their intraweb. 
In addition to these formal policies, he engaged in certain advocacy. He signed four statements that were put out by a nonprofit organization called Fair and Just Prosecution. And essentially, that is also a progressive prosecutor's organization. And the four statements involved capital punishment, election security, transgender care, and abortion. The transgender statement basically expressed, quote unquote, concern about bills targeting the transgender community. And the abortion statement uh, said that the prosecutors would be, quote, committed to exercise their well-settled discretion and refrain from prosecuting those who seek, provide, or support abortions, close quote. But neither of these statements, importantly, went through that policymaking process that I described. So uh, what happened was in August 2022, Ron DeSantis, who was incensed by uh, some of Warren's actions and statements, suspended him. And the governor in Florida has the power to suspend state attorneys for things like neglect of duty or incompetence. And the order issued by Governor DeSantis cited Warren's supposed blanket non-prosecution policies. Uh, and he said that that constituted grounds for suspension under the Florida Constitution, under Florida law. It cited the abortion and transgender rights statements that Warren had signed on to. And it also identified those two policies I mentioned earlier, the low-level offense policy and the bike policy, uh, and also suggested that they involved a kind of a dereliction of duty. And Governor DeSantis appointed a political ally, Susan Lopez, as acting state attorney. And to this day, I believe she is still acting. Um, so what happened was Warren sued under uh, 42 USC 1983, a statute your readers will be very, listeners will be very familiar with. And he alleged that Governor DeSantis suspended him in retaliation for exercising his First Amendment free speech rights. And he asked the court to declare the uh, suspension unconstitutional and require that Governor DeSantis reinstate him. So this went before Judge Robert Hinkle in the Northern District of Florida. That's Tallahassee, so it includes things like the governor's actions. Judge Hinkle held a bench trial, and he identified six factors motivating the suspension. And this is a little down in the weeds, but it's kind of important to understanding how the case came out. So one, Warren's political affiliation as a Democrat. Two, his advocacy for various criminal justice reforms, including the statements. Three, a single statement, a single sentence in the abortion statement that committed to not prosecute abortion cases. Four, the adoption of that low-level offense policy and the bike policy. Five, his overall performance as a prosecutor. And six, DeSantis's anticipated political benefit from suspending a progressive prosecutor. So Judge Hinkle concluded that only two out of these six factors were protected by the First Amendment, namely his political affiliation as a Democrat and his advocacy for these certain criminal justice reforms. And ultimately, Judge Hinkle concluded that Governor DeSantis would have suspended Warren anyway based on two unprotected factors, namely his performance as a prosecutor and DeSantis's anticipated political benefit. And when he refers to pol anticipated political benefit, this refers to things about how, for example, Governor DeSantis is always condemning uh, wokeness and progressive prosecutors and things like that. And his recently concluded presidential, or I should say technically, his suspended presidential bid sort of revolved around some of these types of issues. So on appeal, the 11th Circuit, in an opinion by Judge Jill Pryor, no relation to Chief Judge Bill Pryor, uh, concluded that Warren engaged in protected First Amendment activity, that he suffered an adverse action, namely his suspension, and there was a causal connection between the two. And it concluded that Judge Hinkle committed error in two ways. First, by concluding that the First Amendment didn't protect Warren's support for that sentence in the abortion statement I mentioned about not prosecuting abortion cases. And second, uh, Judge Hinkle uh, erred in uh, concluding the First Amendment didn't preclude DeSantis uh, from suspending Warren to gain political benefit. Because you can do something for political benefit. If it violates the First Amendment, it is still a problem, uh, even if other things that don't violate the First Amendment can be done for political benefit without a problem. So technically what the 11th Circuit panel did is it remanded for the district court to reconsider whether DeSantis would have made the same decision based solely on one, Warren's performance, which is an okay factor, and two, the office policies I mentioned, the low-level offense policy and 
the bike policy. And in reaching this conclusion, the panel concluded that the First Amendment protects Warren's signing of the transgender care statement and the abortion uh, statement. There's a lot of very interesting stuff for people who are sort of, who like me and you are sort of First Amendment junkies. There's a uh, discussion of cases like Garcetti and Pickering and all of that uh, good stuff. Um, but in the end, uh, really, Judge Hinkle just has to redo the analysis on remand. Reading between the lines, it sounds like uh, the panel is kind of nudging him to rule in favor of Warren, but we shall see. I think see. it's a pretty hefty shove, but you could call it a nudge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, sometimes, you know, they won't say it outright, but I'm trying to think, um, you know, there was a case that we actually considered as, as a possibility for today's discussion, the, the Second Amendment Instagram ownership opinion by Judge Michael Park. And that too technically was a remand to reconsider, but you know, if the judge can read the writing on the wall, it's gonna go a certain way. Um, so there isn't a, an O'Scanlan connection to this. Judge Kevin Newsom wrote a concurrence in this case. He went into the political considerations a little bit more and talked about, for example, in the opening paragraph of his concurrence, Governor DeSantis' presidential bid, but he emphasized in his concurrence that Warren's comments on transgender and abortion issues were never turned into policy. That was in the majority opinion too, but, uh, or I should say the opinion of the court because there were no dissents, but J uh, Judge Newsom really, really stressed this. And then I'll just conclude by reading this one paragraph that I think is a great paragraph of his. Uh, this is Judge Newsom. The First Amendment is an inconvenient thing. It protects expression that some find wrongheaded or offensive or even ridiculous. But for the same reason that the government can't muzzle so-called conservative speech under the guise of preventing on-campus harassment, the state can't exercise its coercive power to censor so-called woke speech with which it disagrees. What's good for mine is, whether I like it or not, good for thine. And that really sums up why I like this opinion so much. It shows that the First Amendment is not this partisan issue. You had Jill Pryor and Obama appointee and one of the more uh, liberal members of the 11th Circuit joining with Judge Newsom, a Trump appointee, and one of the more conservative members of the circuit. The third member of the panel was Judge Ann Conway from the Middle District of Florida. I like when judges rule against maybe their political interests and here, that happened in the sense that Judge Newsom uh, is regarded very highly as a judge and could be a Supreme Court nominee in a Republican administration. But here, he did not hesitate to rule against a leading Republican presidential candidate. So uh, this probably didn't help his Supreme Court chance as much in a DeSantis administration, although at the rate we're going, I guess DeSantis will have to wait until 2020, wait, 2028. And by then, you know, Judge Newsom's gonna be a little older, I don't know, but uh, we shall see. So anyway, that's that's the case I selected, and I think for folks who are interested in First Amendment and politics and all of that, it's well worth reading. So that was an excellent summary uh, of a well-written case. I have to say, I am still a little confused um, by some of uh, both of the opinions here. Dan, were, were you confused, or are you, do, you, do you got a smart take on this one? Well, I don't know how smart the take is, but I'll, I'll uh, do my best. I just had a couple of, of thoughts Reading through it. One very quickly, there is um, another O'Scanlan alert on this on this opinion, which is there's a discussion about the applicability of the Garcetti case, Garcetti versus Ceballos, uh, which governs the First Amendment doctrine applicable to retaliation against a government employees. That Supreme Court decision came on the heels of, or uh, uh, reversed the Ninth Circuit decision with which Judge O'Scanlan had specially concurred uh, because he felt bound to do so under Ninth Circuit law, but he wrote a special concurrence saying, I think the Ninth Circuit is wrong. I think the Supreme Court should fix this um, and tighten the, the the rules basically around First Amendment retaliation doctrine. And that's exactly what the Supreme Court did. And it was, I know that was one concurrence that the judge was very proud of. Um, so just a little uh, O'Scanlan tidbit there. On, on, the, on the opinion itself, you know, I, I guess the, a few things struck me. One is that, um, you know, it, the, 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 the language of the opinion and the way that the facts are laid out, I thought was um, uh, of, of the, the panel opinion, is pretty strident. Um, it, you know, it comes, it comes after a trial. And as I was reading through the decision, at first I thought, is this on, on a motion to dismiss? Or, you know, you know, I was kind of reading through it quickly, and then I realized, oh, no, this is after the trial. And it may be that there really wasn't much offered uh, from the DeSantis side to dispute the facts as they were found by the the trial court or, or recited by the appeals court. But um, I did sort of wonder, 
you know, were there factual disputes here? Was there was there any bid? And I didn't go back and read the briefs to be candid, but was there a bid by this by by, by DeSantis to argue that um, certain of the facts were clear? Because it's an intensely factual case, right? Mm-hmm. What would what would the governor have done if he had not been considering these two or three or four factors and only been considering the remaining factors? Um, you know, that's the kind of thing that that trials are supposed to be all about, and usually trial records are at least you know, it, it, you know, if, if there aren't, if it's not an equipoise, at least there are signs pointing both ways. That's usually how, how these things go. And um, so that was sort of one one thing that that struck me. And, and you know, I agree that the, the remand uh, push of, you know, whatever the, <laughs> the word is, seems pretty clear which way the, the panel thinks it ought to go. Um, but, you know, one one wonders whether there's a factual case to be made about the performance of the prosecutor, right? And again, you know, I have no idea uh, whether there is or there isn't. Um, but the panel did, didn't seem to didn't seem to leave much room for it. But again, that ought to be a factual question. And you know, one wonders whether there would be another trial or whether the judge is being asked just to reweigh the evidence in the light of the in light of the panel opinion. I think that's unclear. Um, but you know, the last thing is that that I was also struck by is you know there there is a there, there is discussion about whether Garcetti and Pickering apply in the context of elected officials, right? So let's say that, you know, a line prosecutor disobeys the district attorney or something uh, because the line prosecutor has a disagreement with the philosophy behind a prosecution and the district attorney fires him or suspends him or whatever. Um, that was essentially the Garcetti case. And the Supreme Court says, well, that's, that's part of his job. And that sort of fits within the ambit of what he's supposed to do. And so that there no First Amendment retaliation claim can lie in a circumstance like that. And what the, the panel says, and Pickering is kind of a, a different situation, but it's a similar idea. And the panel says, well, we don't know whether they even apply to elected officials, and but we're going to assume that they do because DeSantis loses anyway. Okay, um, and that's all fine. But I was sort of thinking about it from the other direction, which is it's a it's kind of odd for um, for. Uh, a federal court, I think, to be sort of weighing into um, what's essentially a political spat, right, between two state elected officials um, over sort of just intensely ideological fight, right? And um, you, you, one might wonder whether when you have two elected officials sort of, you know, taking pot shots at each other and maybe using whatever levers of power state law affords them, um, it, it, it's really a, a First Amendment case. At all, and I was trying to think of uh, parallels, like you know, if the president vetoes a bill by uh, you know that's, that's passed by both houses of, of Congress because you know uh, not because he dis- disagrees with the bill as a matter of policy, he just doesn't like the the fact that it was passed by majorities of the other party. He just doesn't like it. He doesn't want to give them a victory, and you know it will help his reelection prospects. Is that he's allowed to do that? He's allowed to veto for any reason or no reason, I suppose. Or, you know, if there's an impeachment, which there is right now, or uh, articles of impeachment um, with respect to uh, the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, can that be challenged under Section 1983 if it's decided or if there's a case to be made that it's not based on the policy decisions the Secretary took, but because of what he ideologically represents or his political profile or, you know, something else, um, you know, the, the implications are are... Uh, potentially significant, and it doesn't. And again, it's just may simply be a function of the arguments that uh, Governor DeSantis made. Maybe he didn't raise those arguments, and so the court didn't address them. But that, there are sort of interesting larger questions that I thought the decision raised, and we'll have to see whether um, you know those are addressed at some point in time. David, do you find some of those kind of current undercurrents there that that Dan's identified? Yeah, definitely. There are a couple of points of Dan's that I would pick up on. The standard uh, standard of review is interesting, and it was mentioned in the opinion a mm-hmm. bit because, as Dan mentioned, this was actually off of a um, this was actually off of a, a five day bench trial, and so here the First Amendment they acknowledge kind of changes things a little bit. They said that in the um, they have not decided in a published opinion whether 
review of a factual finding about what motivated employer to take an adverse employment action is de novo or for clear error. So that's, there were a bunch of questions, unanswered questions that the panel identified here, but declined to get into saying that it doesn't matter how we resolve this one way or the other. Then second, they pointed out that whether the First Amendment protects a particular activity is, so they drew this distinction between constitutional facts and historical facts. Constitutional facts are reviewed de novo, historical facts for clear error. And they said here, whether the First Amendment protects a particular activity is a question of law that is reviewed de novo. So I think that this had a very de novo-ish flavor here. Right. Um, because even though there were various factual disputes, uh, for example, there was a whole dispute over how DeSantis went about, or the DeSantis administration went about researching which prosecutors it was going to suspend, and the versions of the order before it was finally issued, and all of that. At the end of the day, I think the constitutionally relevant facts were fairly straightforward. The other point I would make to, uh, in, uh, in response to Dan's comment about the political nature of the spat. I do agree that federal courts would normally be reluctant to inject themselves in this. But look, uh, 1983 is there, the First Amendment and the 14th Amendment are there. And one thing I would mention just for people who are used to the federal system is the Florida Constitution uh, cabins the governor's suspension power. It has to be for enumerated reasons. These are elected officials who are who do not serve at the pleasure of DeSantis. So it's not really correct to say, oh, well, you know, this is kind of like whatever, at will employment or something like that. He is a duly elected state official and the Florida constitution says he can be fired only or suspended only for specific reasons like neglect of duty and malfeasance. So if you kind of think, well, the president can get rid of an agency head or a cabinet member because they have policy disagreements, fine, but that's not the case here. This is under Florida state law. Yeah, that's a part of the case that really stood out to me uh, being the, the the state constitutions nerd that I am that this is this is an example of the the sometimes frustrating uh, split executive that we have at the state level. So we're very used to the unitary executive at um, I mean even people who don't agree with the unitary executive like doctrine or whatever you want to call it at the federal level recognize the president has pretty wide authority. And so you have like independent agencies that maybe those people can only be fired for certain reasons. And that's a big spat going on you know, right now. State level, it's nothing like that. And so you can have executives above executives, but then exceptions to their executive power, which you have here, which to me kind of meant like, I agree with the, the, the court to some extent that, that this case law, it's like a, a, a square peg in a round hole. It just doesn't kind of makes sense, but also, so that also calls to me the very last footnote in the case, the last um, yes. footnote of of the concurrence, of Judge Newsom's concurrence. He says that the trial judge got into the state law issue, um, which is, you know, whether it was the reasons that you mentioned, David, whether it was an okay firing under those exceptions or a suspension. And you don't, you, you, you shouldn't have gone there essentially. Whereas I see it, the state law issue could mop all this up without even having to worry about um, the First Amendment. And maybe, you know, often I, I, I like getting to the, 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 the federal constitutional issue and have that taken care of. But here it's just such a different situation with kind of no guidance in the in the case law that maybe that should have been more part of it. Or, or at the least, you need to know that framework in order to then decide, okay, how does the First Amendment um, apply? Because it's it's just it's not the normal kind of president press secretary. You know, that's the ultimate example. Is the press secretary comes in the White House and says, "I think what the president did yesterday was terrible." Well, that guy can be fired, fired, and there's no First Amendment violation. Very different situation here, where you really need to know what the state law means before you even get into that. Right, and I mean, I was going to say something. Similar, and I think uh, Judge Newsom's that last footnote of Judge Newsom's concurrence is very interesting. Um, you know, whatever the state law provides in terms of the um, the standard that DeSantis, uh, the governor, has to meet in order to, you know, uh, to support the suspension of the prosecutor as a matter of state law, that's not what the federal court is addressing, right? Um, I mean, there have been right. fights in the past in state courts about whether or not a governor can intervene in in what a, an elected 
a district attorney can do. There was a fight like that in New York during the Pataki administration over whether or not Pataki could supersede the um, offices of district attorneys who refused to um, uh, to bring death penalty cases. Uh, and ultimately, the New York Court of Appeals upheld the governor's ability to do that as a matter of New York law. So there are fights like that, right? And there are all these complex webs of how the governor interacts to other executive officials under state law. But um, again, you know, it, it, it may there there are oh, there are areas of state law that are areas that are primarily governed by state law where there's a federal constitutional overlay. It's kind of like, well, you can do this under state law, but if you go so far, you know, uh, then that's going to be sort of uh, uh, it's it's not a it's not a a good faith use of state law. You think about like Bowie versus City of Maryland, for example, uh, in the, in the due process context, or you know, there's an interesting. Um, Perhaps in October term 2009, for example, some opinions around the the uh, nascent doctrine of judicial takings. Right at one point, does a judicial construction of state law, state property law, amount to a taking under the federal constitution? So there can be sort of like you went too far under state law, and that then you've now wandered off into some federal constitutional problem. Um, but you know, it, it's the, the 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 opinions again for what are probably a function of the briefing and how the case was postured and the like. Just didn't get into that, but those sort of issues are lurking in the background. Dan, you seem to be hinting at a case that maybe you knew something about, but I'm not going to go there, uh, uh, OT09. Uh, and instead, we're going to go cross country. So we just talked about a car- culture war issue, woke prosecutors, reform prosecutors, whatever. Now we're going to talk about another culture war issue that none of us even knew was a culture war issue until a few months ago, and that's gas stoves. So That's I guess right. the city of Berkeley was way ahead of everybody about this gas stove thing. So this case came out originally last May. So some of you may be, oh, yeah, I remember hearing about this. And a Ninth Circuit case about gas stoves in Berkeley. Um, but then it, it, there was a call to – there was an attempt to go on bonk. And then the denial on bonk was just a couple of weeks ago. So that's kind of the the – further version of the case that we now have and that Dan's going to tell us about. That's right. Sure. So um, this is California Restaurant <coughs> Association versus the city of Berkeley. Um, you know, the staid uh, retrograde, retrograde city of Berkeley, California. Um, and uh, it is a case that, as you say, is <laughs> sort of is ostensibly about the hot button issue of whether to ban gas stoves in the name of mitigating climate change and uh, protecting public health. In in fact, so ostensibly about that, but in fact is about the vagaries of a federal preemption doctrine. And most recently with the uh, rehearing opinions raises what I also want to talk about, which is the nuances of the in-bank process and how the circuit courts manage their precedent. So this might be an instance of lawyers making fun stuff, not fun, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. (laughs) We'll see how we go. Um, So, okay. Um. So Berkeley adopted an ordinance essentially prohibiting what they call natural gas infrastructure, basically the piping that goes from the point of gas delivery to the building to the the apartment where you install your gas stove. Um, So they're not saying you can't, they're not saying you're not allowed to uh, install a gas stove. They're saying the building can't have any piping that would allow you to install a gas stove. Completely different. Getting the same result. Completely different. Um, so the California Restaurant Association, and this was you know, applied to new buildings starting January 1st, 2020. So the California Restaurant Association, uh, because this applied to uh, commercial buildings as well as residential buildings, sued the city, claiming that the ordinance was preempted by uh, uh, everybody's favorite federal statute, the Energy Policy and Conservation Act, uh, the EPCA, uh, which until looking at this case, I have to confess I had never heard of <laughs> Um, uh, but I'm confident that it is, it is protecting us every day. So the district court, um, uh, uh, Judge Rogers up in the Northern District of California granted a motion to dismiss the federal preemption claim. There are some state law claims as well, which then she declined to exercise supplemental jurisdiction over. Um, <clears throat> and she held that the Berkeley ordinance does not facially regulate or mandate any particular type of product or appliance and that, uh, and therefore wasn't preempted. And that its impact on consumer products is, uh, quote, at best indirect. So that's essentially what she held. It's an appeal to the Ninth Circuit. It goes before the panel, which is Judge Patrick Abumate, uh, a recent appointee, um, President Donald Trump, 
uh, our former boss, now senior judge, O'Scanlan and um, Judge M. Miller Baker of the Court of International Trade sitting by designation. So that was the panel. In April of 2023, the Ninth Circuit reversed, um, holding that the EPCA preempts the Berkeley Ordinance. Judge Bumate wrote the decision. Judge O'Scanlan and Judge Baker each filed separate concurrences. Uh, we'll talk about them. I'm really going to focus on Judge O'Scanlan's concurrence just in the interest of, um, of time, not because Judge Baker's uh, concurrence is wrong or uh, not interesting or anything, but uh, I'm a former O'Scanlan clerk, so we're going we're gonna to focus on the boss. Um, and uh, then, as you said, Anthony, just after the new year, uh, the Ninth Circuit denied a petition for rehearing in bank over the dissent of uh, 11 judges in total. So Judge Friedland uh, uh, wrote a lengthy dissent joined by Chief Judge Murguia and Judges Wardlaw, Gould, Co., Sung, Sanchez, and Mendoza. That was the, the main dissent. And then Judge Berzon, joined by Judges Paez and William Fletcher, wrote a sort of very, very short, separate kind of Me Too. Um, uh, so quite a statement. few dissenting judges overall. Quite a few dissenting judges overall. Yeah, that's right. Um, and and uh, uh, so, which is just coincidentally, I mean, I realize I think we have, you know, uh, the Judge Berzon group, I believe they're all senior. I could be wrong about that. But um, so that's why they wrote separately. But 11 just so happens to be the number of judges that a, a limited in-bank panel would uh, number in the Ninth Circuit, because of course the Ninth Circuit is so big they can't hear hear things in bank with, with, with a full court. So they will, when they hear things in bank, they hear them in a, in a smaller panel, which is uh, happens to consist of eleven judges. Although the three seniors wouldn't be eligible to sit on it anyway. Um, and the panel also made some small amendments to the decision. So um, just quickly through through uh, the holding of the decision. I mean, the factual background is pretty straightforward. And this, as I say, came up on a motion to dismiss. Um, there was a little spat about whether the California Restaurant Association had associational standing. I'm going to pass over that. Um, uh, uh, everybody agreed that they do. Uh, Judge Baker's concurrence spends a little time on, on some of the nuances, but as I say, I'll pass over that. So the court uh, uh, addressed the preemption question and held that the EPCA does preempt the Berkeley Ordinance. Um, and I think to sort of appreciate some of the interesting nuances in the analysis, you have to here the statute. So the EPCA says, in relevant part, except as provided in certain sections, not relevant, and effective on the effective date of an energy conservation standard established or prescribed by the agency under another statutory provision for any covered product. No state regulation concerning the energy efficiency, energy use, or, or water use of such covered product shall be effective with respect to such product unless the regulation meets certain conditions, which the Berkeley Ordinance did not meet. Um, so the question was what the scope of that express preemption provision is. And for preemption nerds out there, and I know there are some. <laughs> there are dozens of you guys. Yeah, you know, in a large country, I'm surprised we number that many, actually. Um, uh, <laughs> there's implied preemption doctrines, and this is not about that. You know, field preemption and conflict preemption, you know, obstacles preemption, those are not at issue here. Those can, can be controversial. This is express preemption, right? We have a specific statute. So it was about what that what that statute scope was. And the statute defines energy use as the quantity of energy directly consumed by a consumer product at point of use. Um, uh, uh, natural gas is included within the definition of energy. A consumer product includes anything that consumes or is designed to consume energy and is distributed for personal use. So uh, again, energy use, the quantity of say, natural gas directly consumed by any product that uh, uses energy. And a covered product, which is the, the preemption provision operates on covered products, includes consumer products such as kitchen ovens and industrial equipment, which would include you know, commercial equipment used in restaurants. So that's how we get to the California Restaurant Association. So the panel basically says, look, the, the, the preemption provision applies to any regulation concerning energy use. Concerning is a classically broad term. Um, at point of use is not defined. So they say at point of use, it means the point at which you use it. Um, so uh, um, any regulation, either of a product itself or of its use, how much energy it uses, is preempted. Um, uh, so the panel is essentially rejecting the district court's more narrow reading of the statute that only direct or facial regulations of covered appliances will be covered by the 
the preemption provision. The court says, no, it goes more broad than that. So the punchline for the panel, and they say this at the beginning of their opinion, at the end of the opinion, is that a state cannot ban the installation of gas stoves uh, entirely, and so they can't do it, or they, 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 they couldn't ban the installation of gas stoves directly, so they can't do it indirectly by, by going after the piping, which is where I began. So um, Judge O'Scanlan wrote a concurrence, which is really interesting. He basically says, look, I'm joining the opinion only because I think that Ninth Circuit precedent interpreting a Supreme Court decision called Franklin versus, excuse me, Puerto Rico versus Franklin, California tax free trust um, from 2016 requires me to say, the Ninth Circuit cases interpreting Franklin require me to say that the presumption against preemption does not apply to express preemption provisions like the one in the EPCA. So um, first of all, what on earth is the presumption against preemption? This is one of the many substantive canons in the firmament here. Um, and there's a bunch of cases, Supreme Court cases from the early 90s, stretching into the late aughts, late, uh, you know, 2000s, that there is this presumption um, that it applies to express preemption uh, provisions. And it says that you interpret those provisions narrowly. You require a clear statement before you displace historic state police powers. Um, and you look at a, in order to, to, as far as the narrow construction, you look at a fair representation um, of congressional purpose informed by text structure and the goals of the statute. Now, if that presumption sounds to you like a throwback montage from an earlier era of statutory <laughs> construction, you would have a point. Um, clear statement rules based on policy concerns and broad purpose of interpretation are, you know, kind of reminiscent of an earlier era of statutory interpretation. Heady days. That the Supreme Court, yeah, the heady days, you know, uh, uh, what some, some, some people call the bad old days. Um, the current court, right, with uh, textualism in ascendance has sort of largely set aside. But Judge O'Scanlan's point um, is, you know, look, these old cases are still on the books. Uh, in this particular context, and he has to follow them as a court of appeals judge, and the Ninth Circuit has followed them before. So you would, you know, think that would lead him to dissent. But he says, my 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 problem is that in 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 Franklin, the Supreme Court addressed an express preemption provision, and specifically refused to apply a thumb on the scales. Um, and so the circuits are now split about what that means. In the Ninth Circuit, in five decisions since Franklin as expressly or implicitly held that there is no presumption against preemption for express preemption provisions. So, you know, uh, Judge Gallant says, look, I think my hands are tied here. Um, but he goes on to sort of, in a very, you know, Judge O'Scanlan way, very respectfully, you know, with, with, you know, with respect, I'm not sure that we really thought this through. Uh, the court didn't really address these other cases. It didn't overrule them. You know, uh, the Ninth Circuit didn't address the tension between Franklin and these earlier cases in the post-Franklin decisions. I'm bound to follow, I'm bound to follow the post-Franklin decisions, but I think we ought to, you know, someone ought to give this some thought, and it would be nice to have some guidance. And I think that someone he has in mind uh, is the nine men and women sitting at One First Street in Washington D.C. So his concurrence is a really interesting bit of, I think judicial custodianship. And I think it's it's one of the things that I admire the most about uh, the judge. Um, as I say, his opinion sure seems like without the Ninth Circuit decisions of Franklin, he would have felt compelled to go the other way. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, he, 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 you know, outlines a confusion in the law and identifies, you know, who ought to, who ought to address it, the Supreme Court and kind of lays it out for them in a way that makes it as clear as possible. But there is a puzzle in his uh, concurrence um, and from the opinions from April in general, and that's that it's not, it's not totally clear uh, why the presumption against preemption would have made such a difference. If you read Judge Bumate's decision and you think, you know, it seems like he's defining the terms and you know, some of them are defined, some of them are not, What's, what, what exactly, where, where, where's the rub? And I think the Friedland dissent from uh, denial of the bank kind of answers that question. Because she lays out, I think very helpfully, um, sort of the other side of the argument. She says, look, the statute uses terms that, although they're not defined, in the statutory context have technical term of art type meanings. So she says energy use and point of use um, have to do with how much energy an appliance, you know, sort of an appliance is 
uh, is made to expend. It's not about how much the customer uses. You know, if the customer uses no energy or a lot of energy, that's not what it's regulating. It's regulating, you know, what is the energy efficiency and the energy use that the appliance, according to its specifications, will will expend. Um, and that that would then, you know, tend to uh, narrow the scope of the express preemption provision. So that's a reasonable alternative construction. I think that's the reasonable alternative construction that Judge O'Scanlan was worried about and had in mind. Um, and, you know, the contextual evidence for it is real. I mean, it's a, there's, a, there's an honest to goodness debate to be had there. And um, uh, so it may be that the, the, the applicability of the presumption um, has, ha, you know, has a lot to do with how the decision or how the case is resolved. So, you know, um, real quick, what's sort of interesting about the case, you know, I think it, it, it draws some interesting fault lines on how to use the in-bank process. You know, Judge O'Scallon himself, as we said, has been a long time uh, believer that the in-bank process is a valuable tool, both to fix circuit precedent that is confused and to draw the Supreme Court's attention to bad law. Here, he, he's a senior judge, so we can't vote anymore, but he recommended against going in bank. Um, uh, but he wrote a concurrence that sort of spotlights the issue. So one wonders, why not, why not vote to go in bank? And I think the answer is in his concurrence, where he explains there's already a circuit split on this issue. So, you know, there's only so much the Ninth Circuit can, can do in bank. Uh, it, can't, it can't fix the split with the other circuits, so it's destined to go to the Supreme Court anyway. Might as well flag it, you know, as, as uh, clearly as he can and uh, try to get some help from upstairs. And that's a sentiment I know he's expressed in the past. Um, and so that's one reason. And another interesting thing about the case is it raises questions sort of about the duty of lower court judges to follow Supreme Court lines of jurisprudence that have sort of fallen into either dissuadude or disrepute or whatever. Um, and, you know, Judge O'Scallon says, look, as long as they're still alive, you know, you're supposed to follow. Um, and so there's an interesting point to be made there about sort of the orderly handling of precedent, particularly, you know, among the judges in the, um, in the circuits. Uh, and there's sort of underneath all that, or maybe above that, I don't know, is the question of substantive canons themselves, which has become a hot topic. You know, Justice Barrett wrote a really interesting concurrence in the uh, Western University's EPA case about what substantive canons mean, what their what the the basis for them is from a textualist perspective. Is this one like the substantive canons that the court has endorsed more recently, like the canon against uh, or the presumption against extraterritorial application or retroactivity, or is it more like sort of more obviously policy laden um, presumptions? Uh, and that's a that's you know an interesting question how the court will separate the wheat from the chaff. Um, and you know the bank dissent I think raises really interesting questions as well about kind of how to read statutes contextually. You know what's what's appropriate context versus sort of an over literal reading. Um, and uh, I think that opinion, coupled with Judge O'Scallon's concurrence, uh, nicely teased the issues up for the Supreme Court if the court is you know, inclined to hear the case. David, you've been in the, uh, the clerk's chair by uh, Judge O'Scanlan in, in similar matters. Uh, do, you, do you read the, the playbook the same way as Dan here? Yes, I agree. I think it reflects a lot of Judge O'Scanlan's traditional concerns. He wants to help reconcile and to clarify the law. Judge Newsom often writes opinions like this, where he identifies a fault line or a confusion or some disarray and identifies possible ways to address it. So I think that's what's happening here. So I could definitely see the Supreme Court taking this or a case like it for a couple of reasons. One, it factually does involve this hot button political issue of gas appliances, which is on my mind recently because we recently had the gas company come because we got a generator and they have to upgrade our meter and change some piping and stuff like that. And I guess this would not be uh, kosher in Berkeley, <laughs> but we don't live in Berkeley. Um, so one, it involves this very salient, controversial political issue. But two, it involves an issue that is actually doctrinally important, this issue of preemption. And uh, it it's sort of a trans-substantive issue. There are many areas of law where preemption is important. For example, ERISA, the uh, Employee Benefits uh, Retirement Income Statute, uh, preemption is, is a recurring 
issue. And so it's an important issue, and it keeps coming up in different areas of law. And if the precedents of the Supreme Court are not clear, you would think that the court might want to do something about that. And in another sign of its importance, Judge Friedland, in her opinion, uh, in a footnote, or maybe the opening paragraph in a footnote, it says, I've been on this court for 10 years. I have never uh, written a dissental. And she kind of throws shade at them, saying, I don't know if they're really helpful to our decision-making process. She cites an article by Judge Berzon to that effect. But she said, here, I really feel compelled to write in. And so that suggests that this issue is very important to the Ninth Circuit and to the country in a way. I can imagine lots of municipalities around the country, whether it's uh, Cambridge or certain parts of New York City uh, that might want to go after gas appliances. And then you do have to uh, address this issue. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens next in this case. This is going to be, I mean, if it does go to the Supreme Court, I think this would be really interesting, especially when people who actually know the the kind of the minutia of this doctrine, like like you guys do and I do not so much, versus how the media is going to try to 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 frame this case, because of course there's so many cross currents with the usual ideologies here. There's this the new weird gas stoves are bad kind of left right divide, but there's also the 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 dislike of preemption by so many conservative judges, I mean, especially Justice Thomas, who I know has had problems with uh, preemption jurisprudence over the years, and then there's the uh, the the old the the new kind of textualism versus the old purposivism and how that works with textualism, how that works with a preemption. So, uh, watching all those parts come together at the court would be really fascinating and hopefully you know after realizing a little bit of what's going on the the the, the kind of cultural war stuff would be more in the background and and the court could get get to some serious issues that aren't just going to affect gas stoves in in in, in these super blue cities but are going to affect all kinds of things like you say employee benefits and you know a bunch of statutes that maybe some of us at the Institute for Justice think are unconstitutional under the commerce clause but once you say they're constitutional they can do all kinds of things versus city and, and state laws. That's right. So it's interesting in terms of this balance between federal and state law, sort of behind the veil of ignorance, you don't necessarily know issue by issue whether you favor the federal side or the state Absolutely. side. Absolutely. So, for example, take the issue of immigration, where Texas is right now fighting with the federal government over Texas's use of this concertina wire to help keep out migrants. The federal government is saying, hey, it is our responsibility and our duty and our power to control the border, so Texas, back off. Whereas Texas is saying, hey, well, you're not really doing your job, so we're doing it for you, in essence. So it's just interesting. Sometimes, as a liberal or a conservative, you might favor federal power on one issue, or you might favor or state power in another issue. It might depend on which state you're talking about. So um, this is an important issue, even if it doesn't have an obvious ideological valence. Yeah, it's almost like this is this is one of those cases where uh, uh, you know the methodological and the ideological are 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 um, put at, at at potentially at odds, um, and and um, you know because the issue cuts across so many areas and because it touches on so many methodological disputes. I mean, like I said, substantive canon, the textualism. And, and... Well, I'm glad we got, acro- got to cut across so many areas today with our two wonderful guests. So thank you, David. Thank you, Dan. Always a pleasure to have both of you on now. Maybe Dan will, will be a, a, a recurring guest as well in the future. Forward to it. Um, I know you both have things to do later today, so you've been on uh, long enough. So very much appreciate your time. Very much appreciate everyone listening. Next week, we have another couple special guests. Um, I hope you enjoy it. We're going to have a little bit more of a Supreme Court focus next week in in some ways. So won't won't spoil who those people will be for our listeners, but tune in again. But for now, I would ask that all of you thank our guests for coming on. And I'll ask all of you to get engaged.